Blake lived in London for most of his life. Many of his poems reveal London during a time of social and political upheaval. St James's Piccadilly, in the heart of central London, has a powerful connection with the radical and visionary poet William Blake, as he was baptised in the church in 1757. St James's Piccadilly, in partnership with the Poetry Society, has invited five poets to reflect on Blake's poetry and his city, London. All my life I wanted to be a painter and a poet because I thought they were the things that really could count. And Blake was somebody I was lucky enough to kind of grow up with. So really he's like part of my imagination, part of my thinking, especially as we, we share the same London and we always have done. The fact that he had this enormous vision and that he worked between worlds, you know, reality, the imagination, print, paper, painting, ink, he could sort of model what it is to be a, an artist and to be engaged in the world and at the same time 100% engaged in your imagination. I feel Blake inhabits this city. He's one of the really reliable London ghosts. I love the way that he puts like real London places like Finchley and Lambeth and Highgate. He mentions them in the poems and he puts them at the same time as mentioning you know, angels and heaven and all the kind of things that you can't see. And somehow he weaves together this city with our own internal cities, the cities of the imagination, the landscape of the imagination. He made his own rules, he devised his own mythology. And I think that's a really, what we all have to do, that's one of the messages he has for us. Create your own mythology. Go into your imagination and find your own resources. Don't accept what you're told. Argue, create, question. Blake is unique, really, amongst all the British artists and poets because the energy which he kind of pitched into his poetry and his painting and his printmaking, he was inventive, he was playful. He worked a lot in collaboration with his wife Catherine in the printmaking studio and devised this new method to use the acid to bite the words into metal. He had to write everything in mirror writing. It's, it's incredible that he wrote such very long poems when he had to, to put them into books. He had to labour and labour to get them onto these metal plates and to print them. But he kind of invented and devised that. And he worked with Catherine. He taught her to read and write. She was an illiterate child of a market gardener in Battersea. And he, he made a really quite an equal relationship with her, apparently, especially for those days. You know, as well as him integrating all these different creative processes, he also stands as a model for how to persist with your own unique vision. So I think the thing about Blake is that he kind of models how you can live in a rebellious fashion. You can make a mythology of your own and kind of not only live in the real city that has its rules and has its arrangements, but you know, in your own imagination, you're subverting those all the time and you can write them and you can paint them and you could print them, and you could make zines. And that's in a way what he was doing. He was a, he's also a precedent for all of us that are zine makers or want to kind of put our own pamphlets about how we see things, how we see change in the world. And, and he, he made a huge difference. He continues to influence people who've got small presses, people who want to put out an alternative vision of the world, an alternative way of things happening. You know, this is, this is all in the shadow and in the wake of Blake. Blake, having spent nearly all of his life in London and quite central London as well, saw around him every day injustice and he saw the abuse of power by people in authority. And I think he gradually formed all these opinions and ideas and as, as he had visions as he went and he felt very connected to a kind of religious truth about what should and shouldn't happen, what could and couldn't happen, what was good and what was not good. And that's why he's such a tremendous figure as well because his radicalism was born from experience, things that he actually witnessed, people being punished in the street for no reason, people being hungry, and, you know, 
I think London was such a natural place for him to be because although he was such an outsider, he was also very much a citizen, very much part of the whirl of people coming and going and activity and invention. And whilst he was really against a lot of what was happening, the Industrial Revolution, you know, he, he lived in Lambeth where the Albion Mills were, where Dalton Potteries were, and he could see that people were getting exploited. So, so he stood up to authority at every single turn, and that is one of the other things that keeps him a big figure for all of us, really. I guess my poem, it was very exciting to write a poem directly in a kind of ghost dialogue with Blake and thinking about his London and my London and kind of how to push our histories into this kind of parallel poetry. I sort of wanted the poem to move through London and to move through his London and my London, if possible simultaneously. We're walking together, we're talking, we're looking at all of our lives bits and pieces. And at the same time, we're vanquishing chronology by being there together. So we're stepping in and out of time while still stepping in the same city. His London and my London. I wanted to try and bring them together in my poem and sort of make it as an offering, not just to Blake and his spirit, which animates so much of what I do, but as a sort of offering to contemporary London as well. I give birth to William Blake and he gives birth to me. We are the Thames, gush unstoppable, archangel watercolour, goddess ink. We kids jitter like cups in saucers, ready to spill. The wet suede bullet of his head, the shock of it, bearing down on my insides with his insistent notebook. All the tea and poetry we ever drank, all the porter. Under Waterloo Bridge we flow, clattering like oysters. The whores on the strand pack brick dust on their cheeks and the wind whistles sharp on the route master's corner. Aren't those some of Satan's art friends sweeping in from the mud into the flickering theatres? My caftan mother moves us to her Queen Anne ruin. She has a vision. For months we wee behind the holly tree. It's on the main road, unlived in since the war, a dump for Christian tracts. William knows it well. We watch them saw the planks for it when Clapham's still a clod. He shunts by, looks up, spies me in the window of my attic room. I'm 15, wondering if I'll stay for sixth form or ever find love. I'm reading The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Chip papers grease the street. Shops crash down their shutters. Rules are slapped out daily by the lords of spite. Seeds planted by poverty bloom as rage. Covid, administration, Adam and Eve. It's spring and the sky billows lilac over Battersea, puffing clouds into twists of Ferlinghetti, Milton, Ork, who swirl on the shoulders of mothers and sisters, whose gowns are silver, whose shell necklaces tinkle at their throats, whose laughter carries to Surrey. What a blue, cries the poet. And the fiery seraphim reply, Grind the ultramarine, William. Only Mother Sky in her night veil can play harmonica over revolution's drum. Facts are lousy company on reality's sullied tarmac. And here we are when old, still deadline avoidant. No cash in pocket, but a fairy in every municipal tulip. Catherine says Kaddish and salts the cabbage soup. Tigers of wrath run online classes on imagination. My process for writing the poem was first immediate terror and excitement because I was so excited to be asked to do something, especially for St James's Piccadilly, which is, you know, plonk in the middle of my London and Blake's London and kind of is one of the things that would tie us together imaginatively. My process really was to think about that, was to think about my London and his London and where we meet and where we, where we sort of merge and unmerge. So I wrote a huge amount. And actually, after I'd had this notice of the commission, I was so excited, I went to bed and I dreamt. And I dreamt I gave birth to William Blake. And that's what made me wake up laughing. And of course, that led to a central theme in the poem, that I give birth to William Blake.
but I thought it's not really fair because he does also give birth to me. And then I thought about Blake and how a lot of his drawings were destroyed after his death because it, unfortunately a bunch of rather puritanical Victorians followed him and thought that his sort of hermaphrodite drawings that he did and his very sexual drawings that he did were really incredibly blasphemous, improper, you know, wrong. And they, had the, they were all destroyed. But I thought the Blake that I'm engaging with here is a kind of playful hermaphrodite who defies time. And so I want to also use that idea of being a man and a woman, somebody who is given birth to, somebody who gives birth. What is this birth? What are we giving birth to when we write or paint? And I wanted to have that level of, or, or give birth to ideas, you know, as a person. You know, you're not, it's not as literal. And nothing with Blake is literal. It's all to do with symbolism and imagination and taking little glimmers of reality and amplifying them and seeing the fairies inside them, seeing the kind of mythological element to them. So every speck of dust does get its own fanfare, like the grain of sand in Lambeth that Satan cannot find. Why is Blake still such a powerful poet in the 21st century? We invited poets to a Zoom session to read their poems inspired by Blake and to discuss his influence on their work. My name is Joseph Coilo. I'm a children's author and poet, and I write lots of children's books and lots of poetry and have a lot of fun doing it. My name is Ankita Saxena. I am a British Indian and London based poet and script writer, part of the Octavia Collective of Women of Colour Poets and also a former Barbican Young Poet and recent graduate of the Apples and Snakes Writing Room. Hi, my name is Ruth Arulela. I'm a poet for people of all ages. I'm Natalie Lynn Balderston, and I'm a Vietnamese Chinese British poet. And I mainly write about my family history, rituals, ceremony, and Vietnamese and Chinese myth. And my pamphlet is called The Protection of Ghosts and is published by V Press and I'm a member of the Roundhouse Collective and the London Library Emerging Writers Programme. My name is Sophie Herxheimer. I'm a painter and a poet. My books are called Welcome to Inkland, published by Short Books in 2017, 60 Lovers to Make and Do, published in 2019, and forthcoming, a pack of tarot cards called Index, being published by Zimzala. That's, that'll do, won't it? Although you haven't actually mentioned the book you wrote about Blake. Um, <laughs> I'm, my name is Sophie Herxheimer, and my previous publication that concerns William Blake is called The Practical Visionary. And it was written in collaboration with fellow poet Chris McCabe, and it was published in 2019 with Hercules Editions. Shall we begin with the poems? How about Joe? I saw your eyebrows go, and I took that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Joseph Coilo, and this is my poem, The Space Between Us, inspired by the works of William Blake. The world takes on a brand new hue when we are mere metres apart, from this gravely distant distance, new terrors forged in fear wrung hearts. A masked glance becomes a grimace when risky mouth must hide a smile. An eyebrow raised is hard to read when mere metres feel like miles. But there are moments that brighten when space gives space to breathe. I stand and see the whole of you and you, the universe of me. When we happen upon the street, dual concern in dueling minds, our passing becomes a ballet, encircling private borderlines. When we chat with a road between, cars punctuating our prattle, our arms do the talking for us as we gesture through the battle. Now a call is called with concern as we gild family and friends, forging a guilt studied effort, not knowing when we'll speak again. And will the learning learn us 
when all the vaccines have shielded, will we remember our thank yous for the staff that forever shielded, for the clerks that grimaced, smiling under oiled supermarket glare, helping the self-checkouts to learn, thus unemployment to ensnare? Will the planet's sick warning stick when coughs and coffins dodge Headlines, will we still expand and hackle into nature's diseased confines? Will the tiger's brightness brighten when the satanic teals return? Or will the market hunger blacken the fated, fatal lessons learned? I was trying to convey... A I guess just a sense of the feeling of now. It seems impossible to kind of write anything uh, without reflecting on this weird time that we find ourselves in and the reasons why we find ourselves in, in, in these odd times. Um, and I think with, with Blake being a starting point and him always kind of referring to society, it, it just felt like a, a natural shift to, to write a poem that relates to now and what society is going through. Um, and so lockdown was, you know, a, a big theme and, and a, a big subject. And the idea of kind of not seeing people and this new relationship we have with people on the streets and how we, we might see someone. Like I live in a small town, so you when you do go out, you often see someone you know, but there'll be a road between you and you end up having these shouted conversations sort of over the traffic and these sort of passing moments. Or yeah, you know, when you, you pass a stranger on the street, no longer are you sort of at, at risk of bumping into them because you do this weird dance of, of distance. Um, so that's what I was referring to when I talk about, you know, mm. talking with, with traffic, sort of punctuating our prattle. Um, and, and just whether we've learned anything, um, whether the, the good things that have come out of this, you know, the, the gratitude, the, the clap for carers, the saying thank you, you know, whether we will continue to remember these lessons. And I fear, I hope that we do, but I fear that we, that we won't. I, I fear that we'll get back to our, our old ways and we'll continue to expand. And, you know, no doubt there will be more diseases in our lifetime that will pop up because we are continually moving, you know, uh, hacking away at rainforests and, and kind of into natural areas and exposing ourselves to more natural contagions and yet we're still traveling the world and and in close confines um so yeah all, all of that <laughs> in a nutshell how about you ankita how about how are you feeling about sure. reading your poem yeah yeah i'd love to hi everyone my name is ankita saxena and this is my poem guzzle on duty inspired by blake and before I begin, I'm going to read a couple of quotes. The first is the final two lines of Blake's poem, The Chimney Sweeper, which go, Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. And the second quote I'm going to read is the central tenet of the Hindu holy text, Bhagavad Gita, which is, Karm karo. Falki chinta matkaro. Guzzle on duty. Because Krishna tells Arjun, do your work and you will do your duty. Because Bappu says, even a grain of salt can prove your duty. Because the teacher rides alone from Chandigarh to Jaipur and there is always a lamp to study under in the school of duty. Because the soldiers fight in the thick of ice for heaven on earth and, and Arjun surrenders his brothers for the love of duty. Because Blake finds heaven so easy and mother finds marriage and grandmother finds that silence is the best fool of duty because it only takes 10 cows to kill a woman of any class but 100 for a vesya 1000 for a kshatriya the rule of duty 
Because in Cargill the blast is thick with the faithful's tongues. Sanskrit, Arabic, Urdu, Hebrew, the choral cues of duty. Because politicians hand out canisters of gas and bags of rice and say, vote with your mind and we will fulfill your duty. Because the poor man fasts without salt and ginger, love and laughter, only to realise there is nothing left to swallow but duty. Because Krishna opens his mouth and Yashoda sees the whole world and says, no harm will come to you, my son, if you do your duty. So what I was really thinking about was the role that duty kind of still plays in modern day society. I think it's always played a really important role in religion and the way that people connect to God and spirituality. But in, in some senses, people are still bound very much by a duty towards their country. Um, I think also I wanted to respond um, through my cultural background as well. And what I found really inspiring by looking through Blake's work were some of the echoes and parallels that I saw with, with Hinduism and with, with stories that I'd seen growing up. Um, and also his emphasis on kind of uplifting minority voices. I think if he was writing today, he'd be thinking about, you know, ethnic minority voices, immigrant communities, um, and, and other minorities that perhaps weren't around at the time when he was writing. So I really wanted to kind of locate um, his ethos and his perspective on the world in, in a way that was relevant to me. This poem is called The Garden Is Still Growing. Steer me far from the well-trodden path. Let me play among the thorns. The seeds he planted years ago still in decades will be born. Respect for all that does allure. I am tripped by the root of a tree. Ageless like art and vision. Angels wings for leaves. Let's boast the gardener's craft. Despite he be present here. Long after black gowns pass. Sweet flowers still in dear. The growing and all that's already grown. Competes with beauty. Known and unknown. Through the poem I was trying to convey like. I'm really enjoying having conversations with poets from the past at the moment, um, like just reading their work and trying to be inspired from it. So I was, it was a celebration of Blake and some of the poems that I read, I was trying to be inspired from um, mainly the Garden of Love, uh, but I just wanted to celebrate everything I know about him. I did some research into Blake as a poet um, and I was trying to like the angel's wings for leaves was about a vision he first had when he was four years old. I just really wanted to see if I could include that in the poem somewhere. Almanac for mornings. One, plant a peach tree in honour of the goddess with tiger teeth, her pink flecked reins. Two, after the last monsoon, stew cassava until it can be held in the thin throat of a ghost. Three, Leave twelve soft moons, curing under salt. Swaddle them in sweet bean paste, as thick as the earth beside the Red River. 4. Harvest the gourd that most resembles a newborn. Fill each chamber with bone broth and chew the seeds well. For nights. 1. Ask the gods what it means when you dream of a tamed ram with glass peaches hanging from its horns. Two, set fire to a willow branch as a warning to ghosts whose only currency is pearl skin. Three, watch the moon through the city's pollution until it shrinks back into your mother's green birthmark. Four, when the sea wind buckles the elder's bones, boil calabash with ginger and tie the dried gourd shells to their backs. Um, so my poem is about rituals and beliefs, and it's a short personal almanac. And an almanac is a sort of calendar that gives seasonal information and advice about things like planting and tide tables. Um, so mine's also built around the seasons, but it uses seasonal markers that are familiar to me, such as specific festivals and rituals. And my kind of process was that I just thought about the things that have always marked the seasons for me. Mm -hmm. um, so 
for me it's spring for spring it's lunar new year and peaches and for summer it's the vulan festival um for autumn it's the mid autumn moon festival and for winter it's specific kinds of food such as stewed gourds um and then I chose like specific images to represent each of these seasonal markers. Um, and I tried to choose quite vivid ones so that even if readers weren't familiar with all the festivals and rituals I was alluding to, um, the images would still maybe capture the imagination in some way. I was really delighted to hear all your poems and the way that you all have these versions of Blake. There's nothing I like better than everyone having their own version of Blake. It just <laughs> like pleases me. And, um, yeah, thank you for um, letting me hijack the extra zoomy bit. I was really delighted at being invited to be a contributor to the Blake Now thing. I've done a book about Blake before because I feel like Blake's one of my little friends. And um, I've sort of grown up with him really because also I live in Lambeth and I always have done. I've grown up in Lambeth and he made a lot of his best work in Lambeth. And I, I've sort of also always been a painter and more of a painter than a poet. This is one of my paintings behind me. And so I'm very much feel he's a kind of patron saint of the image and text crossover world. And therefore he's of great value to all of us that need encouragement to cross our texts over with our images. Perfect. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so I think the next thing that um, we'd like us to do now is to have a conversation about um, how we think of Blake and his his relevance today. I'm a bit upset by the fact that so much of, uh, that what Blake writes about is so is still so relevant in the sense that he writes a lot about about the city and the, um, about destitution and poverty um, and and people being in need and the state of society and it feels like so much of that is still relevant and you're like ah <laughs> you know, it's like well, over 200 years later and we're still not much better. Um, so I, I found that quite quite shocking, and uh, the the positive being that a lot of the things he writes about about sort of human endeavour and our you know the things that matter about kind of love and sincerity and those things rising to the top are are always true and are timeless. Um, and I found that quite heartening. So I, I think that's why he's he's lasted the test of time because he he does. Like he says, you know, the bard sees the past, the present and the future, and he definitely demonstrates that. And and you could put a lot of his, you know, I mean, London, you know, could appear, could apply to now, minus the chimney sweepers. But, you know, the, the state that people find themselves in and the, the, the stress. And, we, and we're seeing that in the world now when we have protests and, and riots and, and so many issues being brought forward it seems like on a, on a weekly basis there is we're in such a divided country at the moment as well so in that sense a, a lot is very similar to his times and, and to the things he was writing about. I'd echo what Joe was saying about his real concern with kind of people across the spectrum but I think the other aspect of Blake that I found fascinating is his concern about the environment um, and I was really interested in auguries of innocence and how he talks about nature and how you know if you hurt a fly or if you do something bad to a living creature something bad is going to happen to you and I think that is really what a lot of people are really concerned about right now with environmentalism and kind of thinking about how we can build a sustainable future um, and I think Blake was quite ahead of his time really thinking about those things right at the heart of the industrial revolution when actually people weren't thinking about those things people were thinking about how we can expand human profit and and find a way to kind of prosper as as a society rather than prosper sustainably um i think that aspect of blake's writing is really interesting and relevant now as well something about blake's poem that really poetry that really strikes me is just like this love of people and i think joseph put it really well about human endeavor and there is just this profound way he talks about beauty and like just like the beauty of being human whilst he contests that with like so like organized religion um I love the way he writes about organised religion and the way he's like a spiritual person, but then understands the fault of the church, which like, like Joseph said, it's the same things they were dealing with 200 years ago, the same things we're dealing with now. Um, 
so yeah I think Blake really speaks to what it means to be human um which is really really hard to do <laughs> almost <laughs> impossible um, I agree with what everyone said as well. Um, I know that he was writing during the height of the Industrial Revolution. So obviously when the presence of factories was growing and manufacturing was being like me mechanized more and more. Um, and I kind of read the London poem as a poem about the effects of capitalism and empire building mentality. So obviously in the poem you see a lot of people suffering as a result of the work they do to survive. And I think that's unfortunately something that definitely still persists today, um, particularly during the pandemic. A lot of workers have been forced to keep working regardless of their own health. I also think that if he was writing today, um, he'd definitely still be mentioning these social issues because they still persist and the effects of capitalism and empire mentality um, are, def are definitely still present and they'd be preoccupations of his. Um, and I also do, like, think like, um, like everyone else said, that there'd definitely be a focus on environmental issues and climate justice. And yeah, I think he'd definitely be a kind of modern eco-poet. That's great. And and you've preempted very nicely the sort of segue into the next section, which is about um, the the poem London. When we think of the poem, the poem London, and we think of what London means to us now, both our experiences of it, living in it or visiting it or thinking about it, or our knowledge about how it, on one hand, sort of drives the economy of the country, but on the other hand, is an embodiment of, of 101 different sorts of inequality. I wonder if you'd like to, or like to talk a little bit about um, uh, your your experience of London today, uh, particularly in relation to how, how you think and write as, as poets. I didn't actually grow up in London, but I always had extended family in here and um, we tended to visit during Lunar New Year to spend time together and go to um, Fu Guangshan Temple and also go to Chinatown. Um, so for me growing up, it was a place I associated with the wider Asian community and festivity. And I think that's definitely something that I do write into my poetry. What does it mean to be in London in 2021? Yeah. I was thinking, like, I haven't been, um, and I grew up in London, um, yeah. and this is probably the longest amount of time I've not been able to go back. And even though I was reading the poem and I could identify with the struggle that Blake is talking about, um, and I think you put it really well, Julia, about um, the Industrial Revolution and how London is this driving like, economic centre, um, but at the same time, like there were loads of things about London that I love. And I think mainly it is the people, which is why it was so important to see how Blake included all the people, all the different types of people in his poem for me. Um, because I, I don't think a place is anything without its people. And I think one of the things that London boasts is because it is so diverse. Um, for me, it really feels like home. Well, being, being a, a Lambeth boy as well, from ah. born. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've always seen London as, as home, you know, I, I, I don't live in London anymore, but it's got that grittiness, which I think Blake gets in this poem, that sort of gritty underbelly, and I, I don't think you have London without that, I don't think it would be London with, without that, that gritty but also endearing and colourful side, um, but I, I think the poem London is quite damning. Um, but, but rightly so, because of what was going on and what continues to go on, if we're honest. I think you would change, you know, in a modern context, chartered streets become uh, Instagram streets or, or streets where the high street is disappearing. Um, and that, that uh, mark in every face of, of weakness and woe just becomes our stressed out lives and, and how stress is on the rise. And you see that in London. When I, now I live in Kent, when I get off the train, I'm in London, I have to switch into London mode. And, you know, start walking like this with purpose to get to where I'm going. Um, so I, it, there are a lot of similarities um, in, in that in that sense. Um, uh, and the thing around kind of poverty that that Blake writes a lot about is is so apparent. I think, especially the last couple of years, there were so many homeless people, and I, I think that's just down to the governments we've had these last couple of decades and the cutting of services and you see it, you see it on the street. And this is what Blake is writing about, about children being born to mothers who are unable to look after them and about disease running, running rife. 
so I think there's there were so so many similarities still it's, it's a London I, I recognize yeah so I am a Londoner this is the place that I call home even though I wasn't born here um and I think I think London in 2021 is interesting because we've obviously recently had the tragedy of Sarah Everard and, and you know all the protests around that and I think that just called into question this issue around walking the streets of London and what that actually means for different groups of people which is also what this poem is about it's like you know it's Blake the speaker walking through London and, and seeing other people who are also walking through London but potentially having different experiences and I think particularly how he ends on on the image of the harlots and how he, he does talk about women and and inequalities faced by women um, during his time is, is the thing that I think leaped out to me about this particular piece and, and obviously continues to be relevant um, because you know as a young girl growing up in London there were constant issues around safety around you know not crossing the road if you if you saw a group of men come behind you or you know not wanting to go out in the dark alone so I think some of that that fear that he kind of conjures through this poem um, is still really relevant and then other things that Joe brought up as well I think we've obviously recently had the tragedy of Grenfell we had a lot of conversations around child poverty last summer um, and that so much of what he talks about is is still so kind of really saddeningly relevant as well. Um, but at the same time, it is my home. It is the place of multiculturalism, melting pot. And I think something that's quite interesting is that people have mentioned Lambeth. I didn't grow, grow up there at all, but I spend a lot of my time when not in lockdown in the South Bank area, because that's obviously where the poetry library is. It's a kind of this cultural center of London. It's where the National Theatre is. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And all, and all the architecture is still quite brutalist and gritty, as Joe was saying as well. So I think that there's an aspect in, of, of that location that is quite special to me and the river in general. I think I've really, especially over lockdown, appreciated having this river running through London and reaching the river being a kind of milestone um, at the end of my day. Um, so yeah, I think there's stuff to, to praise about the city and, and also stuff to despair about at the same time. I just want to add, because it's so nice to be in conversation with the rest of you and not just on my own with the ideas. So just to, because I think that Blake's amazing perceptions that he had, which were so many times on the spiritual level and as a visionary, as well as a realist, and he negotiated those spaces. So there's a kind of London of the imagination running parallel to the bricks and mortar of London and the streets and the pavements and the people. And what I really love is how he incorporates archangels and devils and all kinds of other mythological characters moving concurrently in the atmosphere of London. So he creates in London a city of the imagination, which I think as contemporary Londoners we're still involved with because of people like poets like Blake and even other writers of London who've documented it over the centuries. They've created an extra dimension to London um, that carries us through all kinds of difficulties by reminding us about the elements, about the birds that cut their airy way and the Thames full of its own, teeming with its own life forms. And so although there's this reality, there's also this space for the imagination, which I think when any of us are walking through the streets, we also hold in our hearts as poets. So we have a kind of we have versions, version after version after version of these streets for years and years. And because Blake conflates time, because he believed in a kind of parallel eternal time. So I like to think that I live in the eternal Lambeth rather than my Lambeth or Blake's lamp. William Blake is still a massive presiding spirit over the whole city that we live in, especially in his poem titled London. I wander through each chartered street Near where the chartered Thames the flow And mark in every face I meet Marks of weakness, marks of woe In every cry of every man In every infant's cry of fear In every voice, in every ban The mind-forged manacles I hear How the chimney sweepers cry Every blackening church appalled 
and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse. Blast the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse.